This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 67, Where the Rich and Famous Eat. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run regainwellness.com and this is the Regain Wellness Podcast. So thank you so much for joining me here today. It's November. It's starting to get cold. It's snowing here in Canada. Hopefully wherever you are, it's not too bad. It, people in the States getting ready for Thanksgiving. We already had ours in October in Canada. We like to get that done early and take all our time going into the Christmas season. So we spread things out just a little bit. So speaking of eating and big meals and extravagance and all that good stuff. That's the topic of today's episode. And we're looking at where the rich and famous eat. And this isn't to be saying you have to eat at the most expensive restaurants and spend a fortune to be healthy. But when we're looking at where these people eat, the idea exists that they're eating ultimately very simple foods and very real foods in their natural forms and what we can learn from that and what we can take away from it. So that's where I'll be heading with all this stuff. So some good information here on things we can do and look to and ways to follow that can really improve our health and wellness and our diet and really get our nutrition on track when we look at real, real whole foods. So the fat, like when we're talking about celebrities or whether you're Jerry Seinfeld from the start or a pro athlete or a Kardashian or whatever, the fact is when you have money, you tend to get the best of most things. And that always includes food. It's it's worth acknowledging that the higher end restaurants you go to and the more expensive the meals get, this is when you'll notice that the ingredients actually get simpler and simpler. And these people have all the money in the world. They just want the best tasting stuff. And that tends to be real normal foods. So how this can apply to you is that we want to eat how the rich and famous would but it does not have to be that expensive. You don't have to spend a fortune and have a three-month waiting list and say that you're friends with um, LeBron James to get into a certain restaurant or whatever. So I think the main idea to take away from all this is to look into that idea of simplicity, and that's what it comes to when the rich and famous and celebrities and pro athletes and whatever, they're eating. They're eating at the world's best, best restaurants, and that one common uh, strain that runs through all of them is the food is very simple. And a lot of this is really demonstrated by the huge interest that is in food-based programming on TV, like food networks, all these cooking shows, everyone watches them all the time. And when you watch the the preparation, whether it's a famous chef or it's a cooking contest or an episode like Chopped or whatever, when it comes to preparation, the one thing you hear, whether it's Gordon Ramsay to Mario Batali to whoever, is keep food simple. And there's a real reason why you want to do that. So we'll look into this a little more. And I, I really think food TV has helped generate this, I don't know if you call it like a real food movement or a, a whole foods explosion, and that people are very much more aware of better ingredients, eating local, all that sort of stuff. So like when the Food Network started, started in 1993, it was barely getting 50,000 viewers a night. Today, you're looking at over a million to 1.5 million a day that watch countless food programs every night on TV through the day. And chef names are now as recognizable as many celebrities. So example, you know, Gordon Ramsay and Mary Batali or Jamie Oliver or Emerald. People know Bobby Flay. Everyone knows Guy Fieri or Rachel Ray. Uh, people know Giada, you know, cooking with Giada or at home with Giada, whatever that show is, or whether it's the Swedish chef, he doesn't count, but he counts to me. Everyone's aware of these high profile chefs and, you know, they're celebrities in their own right. So the big shows everyone seems to watch that always bring into these ideas of real food and keeping food simple would be, you know, be shows like Top Chef or Master Chef. And I've had a few guests on, I've had Andrea Beeman on. From She was on the very first season of Top Chef, and she's a holistic nutritionist, and she came on to talk about nutrition and thyroid health, and I'll link that episode up in the show notes, which today will be regainwellness.com slash 067. So if you enter that address into your browser and go in, I'll, I'll link up some of these other episodes. So she, awesome you know, TV contestant and great nutritionist with a lot of good info to share. 
And MasterChef just had on recently Julie Miguel, who was on the very first season of MasterChef Canada. And she came to talk about all things cooking, how to get confidence in the cook, in the kitchen, where to start, how she got on the road to um, better cooking and becoming a better chef. And this is where, you know, I talk about a lot on the show where people seem to get tripped up is they gain a lot of nutrition knowledge and they learn what they need to eat, but then they don't know how to boil an egg or saute something or whatever. And then they get so intimidated by the kitchen, they tend to turn to more readily, easily prepared foods or processed foods or fast food or whatnot. So I'll link that episode again in with Julie in the show notes today. So you can hear from some real TV contestants who are right in the middle of all this stuff. And they talk about their time on, on TV as well, which I found really fascinating, the whole process and what the experience is like. So some of those other big shows, like I mentioned, Chop, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives is massive. Hell's Kitchen, obviously. Anything with Gordon Ramsay, Kitchen Nightmares. Um, if you want to see Gordon Ramsay at his best before he was super famous, there's a show uh, from the BBC, or maybe it was ITV in England, called Boiling Point. And it shows a very young Gordon Ramsay. I think he's not even 30 or maybe he's just 30. Before he was famous, they started with a show called Britain's Worst Bosses or something like that. And it was an undercover show. And someone went into his restaurant undercover pretending to be a chef, pretending to be a chef, seeing what he was like, seeing him flip out and whatnot. As he's just on the process of trying to get his first Michelin stars and he'd opened his very first restaurant that was under his name. So he's under all this pressure and it's when he's, you know, extremely hot headed and just trying to run this brigade and to get this, this ship sailing to get everything moving. And it's pretty amazing. Cause you see this guy before he's going to become what he becomes, where he's a world renowned famous chef, also a celebrity on, I mean, he was on the tonight show with Jimmy Fallon the other night and he's so famous and it's cool to go back and watch the show and see it all starting. And I think they're all on YouTube. Just look up Boiling Point. I'll link that up as well. But pretty fascinating. Other big shows, Iron Chef, huge show. Restaurant Impossible. You've got, oh, really good. I like Anthony Bourdain and Parts Unknown. And he goes all around the world checking out all these different um, cultures and their cuisines. Another, th- not to keep pushing Gordon Ramsay here, but he does all these shows that, again, I think were British TV. But they I think they air on the Food Networks over here. And they're called, it's Gordon Ramsay's Great Adventures or something where he goes to these different countries. He'll go to India or he goes to Thailand or Vietnam and he immerses himself in the local culture and learns where their food comes from and how to prepare it. And, you know, food at its absolute purest. And yeah, really good shows. So I could keep going and going. I'm sure you know most of these shows. You probably watch all of them. So with food being so high profile now, more people are familiar with these terms of, you know, organic. Everyone knows what farm to table sort of means. If you, if you've been watching South Park, you'll, you'll get that joke. They've done some cool stuff this season talking about the same issue, the, the growth of whole foods and the real food movement and stuff. So these other terms people are very familiar with, whether it's heirloom, seasonal, all that sort of stuff. And again, whether it's the contestants on Top Chef or it's the Master Chef contestants or it's on Chopped or it's Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives or it's Gordon Ramsay swearing his head off, they all stress the same thing, simple, fresh, and local. And I want to look at this idea of this concept with these top restaurants and these super expensive places that these very rich people are eating. When it comes to the best restaurants, the, the simpler the food, the better. And, and it really appears that there is a connection between high flavor and nutrition. And ultimately, a chef doesn't have your health in mind. Um, Jamie Oliver has really changed this movement where he's trying to promote real food and health and wants kids to be healthier and stuff like that. But for the average chef who's just trying to make the name for themselves and, and make money, they really, you know, they're not really bothered with your health. Their responsibility is flavor. And that only comes from simple, natural, and fresh ingredients. So if these chefs could find something out of a box or a packaged food that was phenomenal, they would probably use it. But the best flavors and the best nutrition comes from these real, simple, fresh local ingredients. So look at some of the dishes and ingredients from some of the world's top Michelin-starred 
restaurants. And you've probably heard of Michelin stars. I'll just, I'll break it down here. This is the uh, pinnacle of food expertise and awards. And it is the Michelin guide. Yeah, it is. It's from Michelin tires. And this is an old, old guide from started in 1904 as a road guide for early motorists to see where to eat and where to stop because not a lot of people had cars and, you know, highways weren't obviously what they were. People didn't know what was available. They didn't even know where they were driving really. So the Michelin guide came out for these people who were probably a little more wealthy because they owned a car. So it showed them, you know, where to stop, where there's hotels, all that sort of thing. Over the years, this has evolved into this, you know, culinary giant that awards the best restaurants in the world. So you've heard of, you know, everyone talks about four star dining or five star dining, but the Michelin guide, the Michelin stars uh, take it up a huge, huge notch. So there's three of them. One star, two star, three star. Three is the highest you can go. It's the ultimate top ranking. So how does the ranking work when we talk about Michelin starred restaurants? So one star equals it's a very good restaurant in its category. Two stars, it means excellent cooking and it's worth going out of the way for. So depending where you live in, say, a certain city and it's not necessarily nearby, say if you live in New York and you live in Manhattan, but there's a Michelin starred restaurant in Brooklyn, it's worth going there. That's what that guy means. Three stars means exceptional cuisine and that it's worth taking a journey to the specific country just for that dining experience. That's how good a three star restaurant is. And as of right now, this might be a little different as of, what is this, November 2015, as recently there was only 146 of these three-star restaurants in the world. And when you think of the amount of restaurants, ever think how many restaurants are just in your city. Or again, if you live in New York, how many restaurants are just in your neighborhood, whether you live in like the East Village or the Upper West Side, just on one street, how many restaurants there are. So there's only 146 of these restaurants country that has the most restaurants, what would you say? It's Japan. And the city with the most, Tokyo. So they are the, as, as, as of right now, the culinary experts in the world. So if you look at these top, top restaurants, these super exclusive, super expensive restaurants, you start, when you look at the menus, if you go online and, and have a look, you start to see some of the same or very similar ingredients. You see things like line caught salmon you see grass-fed bison or wild mushrooms wild herbs they'll talk about seasonal vegetables and you know pretty simple and clean ingredients and just as an example here's one of the top michelin restaurants in new york um three michelin star restaurant called daniel in the city here's some of the ingredients from a few of their dishes. Here's one dish. It's got squash ravioli with Brussels sprouts, black trumpet, sage brown butter emulsion, and pork belly. Then another of their top dishes is cilantro stuffed rabbit saddle with confit carrots, chorizo, honey glazed eggplant, and mustard and a mustard seed jus sort of sauce. And obviously these are higher end ingredients, but there's nothing there you haven't heard of before, I, I doubt. And again, worth noting, with these things is how few ingredients make up the dish. Like that first one, the, the squash ravioli, one, two, three, four, five ingredients. That's it. Most, most main restaurants don't like to use more than five to six ingredients on a dish because it starts to complicate the flavors. Um, things tend to get masked or muted or toned down. And when you keep just a handful of ingredients, they all work together, kind of, you know, that idea of harmony and they work with each with each ingredient and kind of elevates the taste of the whole dish they kind of it's like that what do they call it synergy where all those things come together to create even a better flavor and when you put 12 13 ingredients everything tends to get lost in the direction of the dish and the flavors and same thing if you watch these cooking shows where they go in again gordon ramsay or whether it's uh, any of those like cooking takeover restaurant takeover shows they go in and they look at the menu and that's usually one of the main things when they watch these guys cook way too many ingredients They're like dial it back dial it back let the ingredients stand out for themselves let them shine and work together so that's the thing flavors don't need to be overly complicated five or six usually does the trick and this this is the why in say fast food or processed and manufactured food they put so many ingredients in because using all this artificial crap they have to make the flavor 
because they're not using real stuff. If they only used real stuff, they would only use a handful of ingredients. So a good example I always like to talk of is a Burger King strawberry milkshake. 59 different ingredients to make this thing. If you were making this at home, how many ingredients would you use? Four, maybe three. Strawberries, cream, maybe some ice cream. I don't know, just a handful. 59 ingredients to create a strawberry milkshake. I'll put a link for all the, this uh, source with all the different ingredients. And the interesting thing in those 59 ingredients, no strawberries, no strawberries whatsoever. So that's, that's ridiculous. So talking about the top restaurants, the, if you've, you might not, if you follow food or you, you see things like this, you've probably heard of a restaurant, restaurant called Noma. N-O-M-A. And it's a restaurant that takes fresh and organic and local, specifically local, to the next level. It's in Denmark. It is. It has two Michelin stars, but it's been ranked the number one restaurant in the world four out of the last five years. And going into this year, I'm not sure where they're at. But four to the five, the number one restaurant on earth is this restaurant Noma in Denmark. And their whole thing, they only use local ingredients. It has to be within almost walking range of where the restaurant is. They, they drive a little, but the fact is it is completely local. What they do is they send out staff to forage in nearby forests, in fields, near ponds, near rivers, any local areas. And the menu is made up of whatever can be found that is freshly growing and in season. That's what they base this entire restaurant around. They don't bring in anything. They go out and find it. And some of the ingredients they use that they find that are, you know, local to this area, you know, regular things like strawberries, they use flower tarts, they use peas, radishes, wild roses, white asparagus and cabbage they use there, beetroot, rhubarb, nothing fancy with these ingredients they use except that they're local, they're wild and fresh. They're the exact same ingredients you and I could use if we came across them. If you were walking by where that restaurant is, those things are free. They're right there. And... Top chefs obviously make ingredients come together. They they create the flavors and the combinations and they know what works. But at this restaurant, Noma, people wait three months. It's got a three-month waiting list and it's nearly 300 bucks a head to eat food that is growing within a few miles of the restaurant. Like I said, you could walk up and pick those things yourself, kind of see what you know the recipes might, might be like and make them at home for free or pennies. And you have to pay 300 bucks a head to eat at this best restaurant on earth. And that's how important local and fresh and real food is. And it directly has a relation to your health. The, the cleaner the food, the more nutrition that's in the food, the better the, um, the nutrient content, the phytonutrients, the natural fiber, protein, the better that is for your health. And I want to link in an episode I did with a guy named Mark Schatzker who wrote, I think, the best nutrition book of the year, and a lot of people agree, called The Dorito Effect. And in this show, it's all about flavor. And it talks about how food has been kind of, you know, not just genetically multiplied, but sorry, genetically modified. It's so overgrown and so watered down and so mass produced that it's you know lacking in flavor. And artificial flavors are created to put back into these foods or in the case of fast food or junk food or whatever, they put these foods in and they really hijack our senses and trick our bodies into thinking we're being nourished when we really aren't. And he talks about all the different insights and research into how important the flavor and food is for our health and how we crave those certain things that do have um, the, that flavor nutrition connection and how important it is with our taste buds and with our brains. And it's awesome. I, I know this is my show, but I listen to this show all the time. I just want to, like, I reread the book. I just like to hear what he's saying about this whole topic. It's amazing. So I'll link that up. And, you know, go get that book, The Dorito Effect, as well. And it's phenomenal. And you really learn about this importance between the flavor of a food and how it's directly related to the nutrient content within that food and how good it is for us. So, and then just this whole issue with, you know, talking about Gordon Ramsay and these foraging Danes who um, have a $300 per head restaurant and how this has to do with your health and wellness. And just to remind you that food doesn't have to be complicated and your health shouldn't be either. either. When you eat real food, 
when it's in its proper form and you avoid the process of manufactured food like crap that's out there, you allow your body to take in the nutrition it was designed to use. So how this applies to you is the first thing you can do if you're on the road to getting healthy and well and you're not sure where to start or if you've been on it for a while and you just need a reminder is when you start with your grocery shopping, this is the first thing you want to do. If you shop in a regular grocery store, you want to avoid shopping in those middle aisles. That's where all the packaged, manufactured, processed, colorful crap exists. If a food has a commercial for it, you probably don't want to eat it is a good tip. You want to stick to the outer ring of the store. This is where you find fresh, whole food in its natural state. So that's where you want to start. After that, this is when you want to start making improvements. And then you can sort of take things to the next level. It's like a Michelin starred restaurant. You start, you know, lower down, you get one star, you get two star, you get three. It's the same thing with your health and how you look at food and nutrition and your diet. Start basic. So start with that outer ring of the store. Get back to having real whole foods, how they exist. You should be buying a food that doesn't have a, a list of ingredients on it. You know, real food isn't um, doesn't have ingredients. It is ingredients. You use them for other dishes. So once you've begun to in, become to embrace this real whole food, it's time to take the next step. Get away from these big supermarkets and now look for more smaller independent markets. And I would include, even though they're not smaller or necessarily independent, I would include whole foods in this mix. If you're shopping at a big chain grocery store, and then you move into a Whole Foods, that's a great direction to go. And or you might have, you know, smaller family run markets or whatnot. But, you know, these places, they still have kind of that similar layout to a grocery store. They still have processed stuff. And, you know, there's an outer ring and there's center aisles and whatnot. And there's processed stuff. But, you know, the emphasis in these stores tends to move towards fresh and local. And in a lot of cases, the food does not come from very far away compared to giant grocery stores that bring in products from the other side of the world that are picked early and then they ripen through transit and by the time they get to your shelves who knows what state they're in so getting local with your food gives you a more pristine version of that particular item whether it's spinach or potatoes or kale or apples or beef or turnips or whatever so now that you've moved into more of these you know markets and the places that focus on local stuff now you want to start looking into finding farmer's markets. You want to take the next step in nutrition. And to me, that would be farmer's markets. So now compared to these other, like the commercial type markets or say a Whole Foods or whatever, or if you're in Canada, um, you know, we have stores like Farm Boy and we've got, you know, other stores that are trying to bring in more local foods, whether it's Loblaws or, or whatnot. But now if you're getting into local farmer's markets, which have exploded in growth, popularity, and availability. When you're at a farmer's market, you're now meeting the person that's growing the food. And this is taking food to the next level. They know all the ins and outs of that food. They know how it's grown, what to look for when you're picking out certain items. They'll tell you what to, you know, how to gauge it, what to look for, feel, touch, smell, all that sort of stuff. They'll tell you the best way to prepare things as well. These people have devoted their lives to whatever it may be, whether it's potatoes or sweet potatoes or beef or chicken or eggs or vegetables or broccoli. These people know this stuff. You know what I mean? So you know that the food is local because these people can't travel too far because they got to keep the food fresh and they can't spend all their time in transit. They're going to be within a certain amount of miles from that farmer's market. The food is truly organic. It's free from pesticides. It tastes night and day different then the supermarket counterpoints and then you counterparts and then you know you're getting one of the cleanest sources of of food you can get the next thing to do if you want to go one step further is get into this this is you know might not be up your alley but get into that idea of foraging whether that's growing your own stuff i i'd, I'd really recommend you know depending on your climate Growing your own herbs, very easy to do. Growing things like tomatoes, extremely easy. Growing garlic, going, growing green onions, bell peppers. I'm just thinking of the stuff that doesn't take a lot of effort. You don't necessarily have to have a green thumb to do it. They really monitor themselves. You don't have to give it too much attention. And then these things are just in your backyard and you can go out and get them. If you have things like tomatoes and you're growing fresh garlic and you've got herbs 
putting that all together in just say a soup will be one of the most nourishing things you could possibly eat. And it costs you, I don't know, three cents, maybe even less from all that stuff. So this is an amazing way to go. You can even grow herbs in your own, if you live in an apartment, you know, with like a windowsill box and just getting that natural light and a little bit of water. Herbs don't need a lot. They're, you know, kind of like like a wild grass or a weed. They, they kind of do their own thing, but they're phenomenal. And the, the nutrient content, I've talked a lot about herbs before, the nutrient content in herbs and spices is phenomenal. When you're looking at the best choices of foods to fight inflammation, foods that contain antioxidants, by far, herbs and spices rule for that. So specifically, things like turmeric, uh, oregano, cloves, cinnamon, sage, rosemary, stuff like that. Any of them, they're all awesome. Those are the top handful. But also, they're the things that are easy to grow. So I'd really encourage start growing these things yourself, whether it's in your house, in your backyard, or whatnot. And you can get the freshest versions of them possible. Parsley as well, cilantro, whatever. And then there's nothing wrong with the dried versions as well. Just keep these on hand. Honestly, every meal you eat should have some form of herb and spices in it. And you should get these all the time just because of that phytonutrient um, quantity and the antioxidants, you know, they help to fight certain cancers and premature aging in the body and DNA damage in your own cells. Very powerful stuff. So totally recommend to do that. And then that foraging issue, again, this is super, I don't know if you want to say advanced, but um, precise stuff where you're looking at what's available in your local area where it's fine, you know, if it's wild herbs or fruits or whatnot that you can find there's there's places you can find online that are groups that'll take you out showing you what to look for um as far as greens and and whatnot so i mean that that's up to you but that's you know definitely taking the next level and it's you know getting you more in tune with nature and eating what's local to you and what we'd be actually eating if you look at us you know the ancestral diet these are the things they would be eating where i live here in southwestern ontario nearby is one of uh, the old remains from na- old native Canadian villages that go back five, 600 years and, and possibly even farther as they settled at the end of the ice ages. And if you go into these villages, there's a lot of the stuff still intact from the places because they're up on the hills and they have close proximity to the river and water. And they talk about the diet where they would find and grow things like wild potatoes and they would find all these different leaves and and herbs and you can look at what the diet would look like and that's getting really in tune with what your body is kind of designed to eat so again that's advanced level stuff but you can see it's all about that progression the more you get to appreciate real food get to appreciate the flavors and get really accustomed to them you want to you'll just naturally want to find the best versions of those foods possible trust me once you get exposed to them it really gets you on that road to appreciating real real food so start winding it down here just like um, sean croxton if you listen to underground wellness he coined that phrase called jerf just eat real food and that's all you need to know when it comes to your nutrition i like to say keep eating real food not that package garbage but that turns into uh as an acronym what's that current current to bigger so it doesn't really have the same ring to jerf but you know if you want to keep it on the acronym swing go with the kiss keep it simple stupid We tend to overcomplicate food and we don't need to. Everything in real whole food is there how it's intended. If you're getting real whole food, that's the majority of the battle one right there. You're getting stuff in its complete form. So if you haven't, start embracing that outer ring at the grocery store. Stay away from the center aisles, the package, the manufactured crap. I can confidently say if what you eat comes in a package or a box, it's not a good food to be healthy at all. Stay away from things that have ingredients on them ingredient lists and profiles and stuff like that. Um, Focus on real, try to get double digit servings of green leafy vegetables each day. Stay away from vegetable or seed oils. Try to find, you know, olive oil, coconut oil for your own dressings. Look at drinking a lot of water, start cutting out the sugar, especially from beverages. Real food in its proper state is what you need in order to take back your health. And that's Basically, all I have to say about that. So if you have any questions or things you want to talk about as far as what foods are good or what you want to be including, make sure you sign up for the Regain Wellness 
healthyeatingstarterkit.com newsletter because when you do sign up, I send off this free ebook called the Health Eating Starter Kit. So getting that gets you on track with some more of those specific foods you want to be including and just importantly, things you want to be avoiding and why you want to be avoiding. Uh, sorry, why you want to be avoiding those. It's also got some recipes. So if you go to reganwellness.com slash guide, you can sign up for that and it's sent on over to you right away. And it's also, if you go to the main page on the website, there's a sign-in box rate when you're greeted besides seeing my charming face, which is up there as well. So if you're not too distracted by that, make sure to sign up. And then there's a lot of information I share just through email as far as, you know, whether it's um, nutrition insights, recipes and whatnot. So thank you for joining me. Hope you like the show. If you do, please subscribe on that old iTunes machine just so you can get them constantly delivered to you. If you do like the show, if you could hook me up with a rating and review, that would be pretty sweet. Do me a solid and then more people get exposed to the show. So in your own health pursuits, remember like how it's not going to go perfectly, but that you're making these strides and always focus on progress and not perfection. See you next time. Thank you.